If you are a long-time listener, you know that our August emphasis is always that of revival. And if you tuned in the past two days, you're aware that this marks my third visit with Dr. J. Edwin Orr, who has lectured on this topic at countless college and university campuses around the world. He's also authored scores of publications on the topic of revival. So welcome to the Chapel of the Air. Probably Dr. Orr's most popular book is Full Surrender, which has now been translated into 15 languages. He also wrote the revival hymn, Search Me, O God. I remember seeing that even when I was younger and growing up in the church. Has all of your creativity gone into this one topic, Dr. Orr? Not altogether. I did have a ministry in the Air Force during the war, which wasn't a revival ministry, and it led to ministry in universities and colleges where I developed a kind of evangelistic apologetics. But apart from that, my main interest has been in revival. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about revival as it relates to a local church. When we speak of revival in a given church, what are we not talking about? We're not talking about a week of meetings for the aggrandizement of the membership or evangelism. We're talking about a week of meetings for the deepening of the spiritual life. When you say deepening of the spiritual life, do you mean perfection of the spiritual life or not? Both perfection and deepening. In the sense, I use the word deepening in the sense that people who have been shallow in their Christianity will become more profound. Are you using the word perfection in the sense that all of the problems of the church will be solved if they experience revival? Not all of the problems, but a great number of them. <laughs> I like the way you say that very much. Can you either define for us or picture what revival in the local church would look like? Well, in one sense, if any congregation of God's people were to obey the light that they presently have, they would enjoy a measure of revival. In that sense, Finney is right, and he says, revival is nothing more than the right use of the appropriate means. But I don't believe it's a matter of just simply organizing, choosing dates. I think Finney's illustrations are rather unfortunate, just as a farmer chooses a day to plow the field and chooses a day to sow the seed and chooses a day to reap the harvest so you can choose the time to have a revival. I don't believe that. I believe we're dealing with a person, the Holy Spirit. But in one sense, any church that puts things right to the extent of their knowledge would enjoy a measure of revival. But as far as ongoing revival is concerned, I think there are other factors come into play. Okay. Share a personal experience from your long ministry, Dr. Moore. Would you believe a local church actually knew genuine revival and you were there to see it? I remember in, I think it was probably 1950, in a Lutheran church in Lingwood in California, the pastor and his wife were hungry for a measure of blessing in their own souls and hungry for something in their own congregation. And they did a rather, shall I say, risky thing, inviting a Baptist preacher to come and preach in a Lutheran church. But the ministry God blessed, and by the Wednesday we were continuing on until 10 and 11 at night with the full church. Were you preaching that long? Yes. Well, I would preach and then turn it over to the people. They would respond and be having questions and uh, testimonies and a general open meeting following that particular pattern. There was such revival that it standed into evangelism. He took in 1,400 new members in the next year. Hmm. I'm glad it happened that way. I'm not a statistic collector. I don't go around saying so many were converted in our meetings and so forth. I'm far happier to see an ongoing revival like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, that lasts quite a number of years. That's thrilling. You mentioned the pastor. Is the pastor usually a key in terms of revival in a given church? I believe so. I think if the pastor is set against it, there will be no revival. And the people may have to pray that either God will change his heart or remove him. Now, historically, has this been a pattern where oftentimes ministers have opposed the working of God in revival? Oh, yes, because sometimes pastors feel that... uh, the element of confession that comes into a revival may expose their lower standards of Christian living. Mm-hmm. Is confession usually a normal part of revival? Well, an essential part. But I don't believe in indiscriminate confession. I've always given it to the maxim, let the circle of the sin be the circle of the confession. I think I need you to define that further. 
say exactly what you're telling us. Well, if a person sins secretly, let him put it right with God, who alone knows about it. If he sin privately and it's hurt someone else, he ought to put it right with the person that he's hurt. He doesn't need to tell the choir about the lie he had with his wife. He needs to put it right with his wife. But then if his sin is known openly, he ought to put it right as far as it is known. You know, how did you say that back at the beginning about the circle again? Let the circle of the sin be the circle of the confession. Okay, that's very, very helpful. If you were to preach a revival series, and we'll say that we'll call it that anyway, in a given church, where would you begin? What things would you pick up just to lay a base for what you're talking about? I would preach first on the first word of the gospel. It's the word repent, and it means to change. It doesn't mean to feel sorry. The word metanoia means to change their attitude. I preach on repentance as the first word of the gospel. Then I speak in what way they have to change. We deal with the subject of sin. But one typical way, with instance, if you take the standards of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord spoke, you shall not commit murder, but I'm telling you, don't lose your temper with your brother. Now, that's a strange comparison. But you see, bad temper is murder in the heart. In other words, it's not enough not to commit murder, but don't have any murder in your heart. It's not enough just not to commit adultery, but don't have any adultery in your heart. The standards for Christians are higher than the standards for the world outside. So, preach on sin. Preach on the law. I mean, I like the Lutheran emphasis there, law and grace. But then, to preach on forgiveness and confession and all the rest. Mm-hmm. Leading up to total commitment, which is the crisis of sanctification. Would you say one of the signs that revival is desperately needed is the lowering of the standard of righteousness in the church today? Yes, of course. It's a wider problem than that. George Gallup told me the other day that the number of people who claim to be born again has risen from 46% to 53% of the population. I quoted this to 50,000 people in the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, and some started to applaud. I said, I don't believe this. I have lived in the same house for 35 years in California. You couldn't kid me that more than half my neighbors are born again. Then George Gallup today has brought out a new comparison that there isn't much difference in the lifestyle of the church and the community today. That sounds like ancient Israel, doesn't it? Yeah. So that uh, I would say that the problem is not really the local church. I'm going to say something else in case we miss it. Someone asked me, a member of a very prominent denomination, wouldn't it be wonderful if God started with us? I said, I don't think he would. I said, it would be nice if he would, but I said, you're about the least ready to share it with anyone else. And there's a factor. Some pastors think revival means success for me, success for my church. But God's concerned with all the churches in the community. That's why I like to see Armand Gesswein go around and get pastors of different denominations to pray together. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. So there's a, almost of necessity a coming together of the various churches and a putting aside of one's personal agenda and one's own reputation and the holding up of the kingdom or the broad base of the work of Christ. I could, I could illustrate that during the times of revival in 49 in California as a pastor came down from the San Joaquin Valley and to one of the minister's prayer meetings, he said, this is what we need. He went back to his hometown and sent out notices by postcard to all the pastors say there'd be a minister's prayer meeting on Thursday mornings. Nobody showed up. Then he called them all individually. He thought he hadn't been personal enough. They all began with one consent to make excuse. The best excuse was one fellow who said, I've got a good sermon in prayer, but I'm too busy to come to your prayer meeting. I'll come and give it sometime, though. <laughs> Wild. But um, he thought, well, I'd better start with someone, so... He thought, who lives a Presbyterian? He thought, now, the Baptist man's a good man, but a bit narrow-minded. I'll go along and see him. So uh, he went to greet the Baptist pastor and said, I've come to pray with you. There's no way out of this, so they prayed together. But then next week they got in the Nazarene and then the Episcopal rector and told the, all 17 ministers. Then they started United Evangelistic meetings on Saturday nights and they had bigger attendance in the population of the town. But this is what the Presbyterian minister said. He said, I was talking to that Baptist the other day, and he said, you know, brother, before the Lord revived my heart, when I met someone that didn't see the truth of believers' baptism in the way the Baptist teach it, I treated him like a heathen and a tax collector. But he says, the Lord revived my heart, and I'm quite willing to let him be wrong. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. From your studies, Dr. R., is there any group in a local church that kind of characteristically is touched first by the Spirit, like the young people or the women or the older people or whatever. You could go back in your mind and your studies. I'm wondering about this. I find that as far as 
being touched to pray, it's often the older ladies. But I find that as far as the first movement's concerned, it's always the young people. Hmm. So it's the younger people who respond to the message. Mm-hmm. It's part of the scripture. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That's really true. As I think back even uh, Jonathan Edwards' ministry, isn't it? It's the young people of town who first began to respond to what he was saying. Some people say to me, but it was Peter that did the preaching. I say, if Peter said, this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, that must have been happening. Yes. At Pentecost. Uh-huh, that's interesting. How close to a revival do you picture the average American or Canadian church being? I think they're far away. I do think there are signs of a movement, but uh, most don't know what the word means, and they don't know what price to pay. But there seems to be a wistfulness, and I think I find in my studies of revivals that before God sends a general revival, maybe even ten years before, There are little local revivals, pray God, which demonstrate what he can do and also raise up a leadership for the general movement that's yet to come. That's interesting. Now, are you seeing that ten-year cycle begin or not? I think it's begun. Uh So that means there could be good things ahead, but at the same time, you're reserved to be able to say too much right now. Maybe it's too early to call the game, huh? Well, it's just that uh, I don't think a lot of them have started even yet. Oh, far too many pastors worship success rather than revival. Yeah, Lord, help us in that area. It's very much a part of the day. I, I don't doubt what you're saying at all. How will genuine revival in the churches of the United States and Canada affect the rest of the world and what God is doing in other countries? We mustn't forget that we've got a very large missionary force from North America, probably the bulk of the missionary force in the world. So it would affect it through the missionary enterprise. But on the other hand, God is capable of working quite independently. I suppose one of the great centers of revival today would be the province of Hunan in China, where the latest word I've had is that they're sending pastors and missionaries to all the provinces in China. There's been such a movement in Kaifeng and around that way. It's incredible. I've never even heard of such a thing. No, I don't have any time to pursue it, but this is in mainland China? Yes, in the province of Hunan. Hmm. We should have another broadcast. (laughs) <laughs> My sincere thanks to Dr. J. Edwin Orr for these visits. Later this month, you'll hear from another man whose name has long been associated with revival, Leonard Ravenhill. Recently, I was in Texas and recorded three interviews with him. My thanks also to Back to the Bible broadcast for allowing me to use their studios in Lincoln, Nebraska for these three visits with Dr. Orr. Now it's back to Ted Seeley in our chapel studio in Wheaton, Illinois. Wherever they're spoken, David, in China, California, or Nebraska, words about revival challenge and encourage me. Be sure to join us on Monday when our director, David Maines, begins a three-week investigation of the physical and spiritual drought in Israel during the time of Elijah. For Elijah, a little cloud like a man's hand signaled the coming season of spiritual refreshing. Here at the chapel, we've prepared a card full of hand-shaped clouds. Actually, they're cloud symbols imprinted on pressure-sensitive stickers of various sizes. And they're designed to help you remember to pray persistently for the cloud of revival to soon appear on our horizons. Request these cloud-like-a-man's-hand reminders when you write to us at the Chapel of the Air, Wheaton, Illinois, 60189. In Canada, The Chapel of the Air, Box 2000, Waterdown, Ontario, LOR2HO. Your financial support for this broadcast also demonstrates a commitment. We greatly appreciate each gift that enables us to continue issuing an insistent call to significant Christianity, especially during these financially dry August days. Write us today at the Chapel of the Air, Wheaton, Illinois, 60189 in Canada box 2000 Waterdown Ontario LOR 2HO on Monday David begins exploring revival through the life and ministry of Elijah please join us for these powerful broadcasts here in the Chapel of the Air